And now we're going to look at Chapter 6, Part 2 in Lifestyle Management around managing our weight. So in this part, in managing our weight, we're going to consider some of the practical weight management tips. In these difficult times, some people face some difficulties with their relationship with food. Life can get really busy, complicated, and very challenging. And in this spite of all of this, we still need to eat and need to move to be healthy. So now let's look at some of these and we're going to begin right away. All right, we're going to begin with a practical guide to weight management. Now there's a few things that I'm going to reference here. One thing is no diet can produce permanent weight loss or weight gain successfully. Weight management requires a, long, a lifelong commitment to healthy lifestyle behaviors, emphasizing sustainable and enjoyable eating, uh, eating um, practices and daily physical activity. Another key to long-term success is tailoring any weight management program to the individual's sex, lifestyle, cultural, racial, and ethnic values. It's really going to increase the likelihood when we align ourselves with these values that we find so important, it will help our ability to stick with any lifestyle changes. Now we're gonna start with overcoming a weight problem. Each year, an estimated 70% of women and 35% of men are dieting at any given time. No matter how much weight they lose, 95% will gain it back within five years. That tells us an awful lot about dieting and its success rate as opposed to healthy eating within our lifestyle, and healthy physical activity. Most dieters cut back on food, not because they want to feel better, but instead because they want to look better. And that's a real juxtaposition because looking better isn't necessarily healthier. Eating in a more healthy manner is going to have a bigger and longer lasting impact. I will be repeating that a lot. The best approach to weight problem depends on how overweight a person is. For extreme obesity, medical treatment, including gastric surgery, surgeries, may be necessary to overcome the initial dangers of, a, you know, of the person's health and life in the short term. For people who are moderately to mildly obese, Doctors recommend a six-month trial on what's known as a lifestyle therapy, including a supervised diet of exercise. So what's being recommended here when you talk about moderate or mild obesity, heavy obese or overweight people, it's, is to avoid participating in unhealthy plans for short periods of time and to try to dedicate a six-month period to a healthy plan try to avoid looking for quick fixes. Instead, make every effort to stick to six month lifestyle therapy. Now you don't have to necessarily, although it's highly recommended that you see a doctor, certainly if you've been overweight or obese for some time and you're looking to make a lifestyle change. Looking at lifestyle therapy is just really examining one's own life and how you can introduce health into your lifestyle. The key to overcoming obesity are addressing individual differences, altering unrealistic expectations, setting limits, learning coping skills, to provide self-nurturing without relying on food. Rather than going on a low calorie diet, people with BMIs of 25 to 29, which is in the unhealthy side of the BMI scale, should cut back moderately on their food intake 
and concentrate on developing a healthy eating and exercise habits. So this could and should draw our attention to, so how, what goes in to customizing a weight loss plan? Two things are really key is to be aware there is no one diet fits all, okay? Everything should be geared to you, not you and everybody else. And two, it's recognizing that the way, the way that you tend to put weight on and developing strategies to overcome them based on that, based on your own reasons, not somebody else's. So for those who may not be doing, you know, who may be doing the assignment uh, where you're going to try to lose some weight, keep in mind, why do you eat the way that you do? Why don't you exercise the way that you'd like? What are the things that are holding you back? You can work on getting to where you can actually eat in a more healthy way and to be able to approach food healthfully and be able to engage in some lifestyle activities to keep you healthy. For example, do you just like food and eat it a lot? And if yes, consider keeping a diary of what you're eating. Look for patterns, record calories, fat grams to assist in identifying opportunities. Do you eat for emotional reasons? Are you bored? Are you frustrated? Are you angry? Better to deal with the emotions than to eat them. Are you a grazer, a nibbler, a snacker? Well, maybe it would be better to set up a low-fat veggie and water station in your fridge so when you go to graze and snack, you're choosing healthful foods. Move more often. Physical exercise does burn calories and gets you fit. And remember, you know, I, well, I'm going back a ways, but I think it was around 1981, October 26, when I quit smoking. My strategy while quitting smoking was to walk and carry a briefcase where I had carrot sticks and celery sticks in it. Because I was aware that you, can, you often gain weight when you quit smoking. Not only did I quit smoking, but I lost 15 pounds. Weight loss plans that use good nutrition, healthy food groups, and reasonable exercise all can facilitate healthy weight loss. We are all probably aware that there are other diet strategies that promise fast and easy results. As with many things, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't true. Let's now review a few fad food diets, diet foods, may be labeled as light or low calorie. However, they're probably very high in sugar and calories. It's important to not just read the label, but to understand the label and the foods that you're purchasing. For example, um, Alstra, it's a synthetic fat substitute and it tastes like fat However, its molecules are so large that they can't be digested. So they just pass through our digestive tract without leaving any calories behind. Therefore, we don't benefit from the calories in food. Um, Canada has rejected Ulstra as a food additive based on its own research. In fact, in the United States where it's being used, the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, has received 18,000 know, re reports of gastrointestinal distress. Now, that's only one example. And so it's really just important to remind ourselves to understand the labels and understand where our calories are coming from. Fruit made with fat solubles, fat substitutes, sorry, may have fewer grams of fat, but they don't necessarily have significant fewer calories. This road to healthier eating takes a little bit of education and learning about how to read labels 
so we are understanding you know what we're eating and it is in fact good for us so now let's touch on what are known as and you, if you've dieted more than once you probably are familiar with the yo-yo syndrome the yo-yo syndrome is the on again off again dieting it's also it, it's a self-defeating process of trying to diet gain it back diet gain it back diet gain it back it can also be very dangerous it's also known as weight cycling and it may make it more difficult to lose weight and to keep it off to break and or avoid the yo-yo syndrome and overcome its negative effects by exercising exercises don't need to be as complex as you might think going for a walk doing i don't know five eight 10,000 steps per day is great exercise. That exercise helps alleviate the dieting that goes like goes like this because there's a lot of dieting that goes up and down, yo-yoing, and it doesn't involve a pill or a pill to weight loss. It's about healthy eating and exercise. Now, the third area to avoid or to be wary of are low-calorie diets. Diets that provide fewer than 800 calories a day can be risky. I would almost be saying, you know, no kidding. 800 calories a day, you can barely exist on that. On a very low calorie diet, as much as 50% of the weight you lose might be muscle, not fat. Muscle weight helps us engage in physical activities. The ill effect of a very low calorie diet includes low blood pressure, dizziness, lightheadedness, fatigue, nausea, abdominal pain, hair loss, irregular menstrual cycles for women, slowing of a metabolic rate, and slowed reactions. These metabolic changes may make it harder for people to maintain a reduced body weight after dieting. Now next, be very wary and of course something that we're probably all aware of is popular and fad diets diets such as high protein low carbohydrate diets or the ketogenic diets there's no scientific evidence for proving that prove that this these diets are in fact effective there is no scientific evidence proving that a diet providing more than 10 to 15 percent of protein recommended by the federal guidelines enhances health and athletic performance. It doesn't, not yet. Not in that form, in that way. Scientific advisory warnings that high protein diets are potentially dangerous because they increase the risk of heart disease, diabetes, stroke kidney and liver disease and cancer it is important to recognize that you know um, any healthy diet doesn't mean increasing one of the three main food elements protein calories and fats and lowering everything else instead it main it means maintaining the levels which are healthy and maintaining them over each meal Therefore, when we see these fad diets that say high carbohydrate, low protein, or high protein, low fat, we have got to question this because there is not any scientific support for any of these claims. These are just ways for companies to market ideas to sell books and materials and services and products to make other people rich. Now, while dieters just eat as much or even more food on some low-calorie, low-carbohydrate, low-fat diets, they are ingesting fewer calories and much less fat. However, this practice can be so unsatisfying that many people can't stay on the diets for sustained periods. They end up dropping off the diet and then binge eating, creating what we already know is unhealthy eating behaviors. All right, another point. It's worth drawing our attention to this is over-the-counter diet pills. 
Now, in people's search for quick fixes to weight problems, millions of people have tried often risky remedies. You may have heard some of the professional athletes. This was a few years ago um, with diet pills. Um, what it did is it increased the athlete's heart rates. And when they were involved in their practices in the summer with high heat, their heart rate was already going up. So those two combinations created heart attacks. The search for the perfect diet drug continues with plenty of economic incentives for drug makers. So people don't need to do the work to eat healthy and exercise. They want a magic pill, but one just doesn't exist. And I will put yet, I suspect there will be at some point, but I don't know. And I'm sure something will happen that will create something like a pill. The basis of being healthy, and you can say it with me, eat healthfully, engage in physical activity daily. Physical activity, it's a helpful approach, is the combination of exercise and cutting back on calories. Now, this may, may be the most effective way for taking weight off and keeping it off. Exercise increases the energy expenditure stored and builds muscle tissue, burns off fat, stores and stimulates the immune system. It may be that it is also reprogramming our metabolism so that individuals not only burn up calories during, but also after a workout. Some everyday activities such as walking, gardening, household chores are effective as structured exercise programs in maintaining or losing weight. Anything that increases your heart rate for sustained period will benefit your body and help your metabolism. People who start an exercise program during or after a weight loss program are keeping, or sorry, are, are consistently more successful in keeping most of the weight off. So what if you want to gain weight? I've been talking a lot about weight loss and obesity, but what if you want to gain weight? Well, how do you do it healthfully? I know that might not be, you know, the most, or it might not be the most usual question. You may find it peculiar because most people aren't seeing that as a problem, gaining weight. Being underweight is not, as un is not an uncommon problem, particularly among adolescents and young adult men, as well as those who diet excessively and suffer from an eating disorder. If you're someone looking to gain weight healthily, you need to follow these suggestions for weight gain because it can be very helpful. There's more detail and certainly a doctor's supervision would be helpful is eat more variety of food. Sometimes we get into a habit of just eating certain foods that we like, but we forget that there are other foods that are also useful and good for us and more variety is usually good. That's one. Two, if your appetite, you've got a small appetite, eat more frequently. Maybe instead of three meals a day, you have six smaller meals a day. Manage your stress level. Many people eat because of stress, but not the right kind of food. Eat high fat and high carbohydrates, simple sugars. Exercise regularly. And in the exercise that someone is trying to do in particular for weight gain, that would be more strength instead of endurance. All right, now we're going to turn to the psychosocial view on weight management. Psychosociology. This is a combination of psychology, which is the what is it that makes me me from the inside, and sociology, which is how do others and groups affect me being me from the outside. So when we think about these psychosocial views, on weight management, one issue that pops up is weight discrimination. 
To address obesity issues in society, we must be cognizant of the need for people struggling with weight. The stigma and discrimination expressed towards people who are obese are pervasive and impact people both psychologically and physically. Now, you're probably very aware of uh, body shaming issues that occur online and people targeting others who think that they are some authority on what's right or wrong for other people. We seem to understand that it's not okay to tell jokes about certain groups of people. However, it appears as if it's still acceptable in some parts of society to joke and poke fun at people who are struggling with weight. Society, it seems, condones weight stigmatization as a way of motivating obese of someone who's obese to lose weight. When has that ever been the case, yet we in society seem to think that it's the way to do it, but it's discrimination. This is not beneficial to reducing obesity rates as it generates health disparity and interferes with effective obesity intervention. Many people who have weight issues are also dealing with other emotional issues. To be body shamed and to be discriminated against just elevates those other issues. Another point um, to bring up in terms of obesity is economics. Economic framework helps to explain some psychological effects. Of, of obesity. Now, one of the main areas when we talk about economics is income. An income effect is present when food is one of the main, you know, one of the main things of value. And of course it is. We want to and need to purchase within our budget. If I have X number of dollars for food for my family, that's what I have to spend. And so that budget varies from person to person. So like more recently with food prices being higher, which can result in higher caloric intake, some of the foods that we choose to pick because the result of our lower income. With less money to spend, cheaper food is not always as good for us because of the higher fat, sugar, and salt. As options for food are compromised, there has been an increase in over-the-counter coffee stores, bakeries, fast food restaurants. And since these are easy to see, they're easy to get to, and they're relatively inexpensive, we tend to fall into these traps. We call it the substitution effect. And it suggests that the emerging econ economic recovery and further technological advances will lead to this inevitable rise in obesity levels continually in North America. Now, what could the government be doing? Are there things that it's doing? The provincial and national governments are addressing or attempting to address nutrition, overweight, and obesity issues by developing and designing national initiatives and program strategies for the future. These include, uh, these include improving basic nutritional strategies, serving size. Now, so for example, what's considered a normal serving size? Mm -hmm. Nutritional labels, banning certain foods and ingredients, regulating sodium consumption, limiting access to junk foods in schools and community centers, designing partnerships between nutrition, physical activity, health and economics, medical school, and community leaders. There's, so there's a great deal of effort being focused on this. Now, one place that might affect your eating, because you're a student, it's eating on campus. Eating habits often change immensely when a student begins their college studies while attending uh, begin their college or university studies 
the most common weight related problem is gaining weight, particularly in the first year. It's known as the freshman 15. A study revealed that eating factors, no, a study revealed that eating behavior was related to lifestyle factors, the hours spent on campus, commute time to campus, weekly budgets for food, less food is less fast food is purchased and consumed on campus. You probably have an opinion about what food is available on your campus. Part of that might be around availability of healthy choices. Some of that might be kind of related to costs, but at this rate, you can see how that could affect your weight. In your first year, it's also when you have the freedom, you know, to, uh, no one is really telling you what you can and cannot do. Um, so to address this unique nutritional uh, needs, uh, many colleges, most college administrators, faculty and student service, recreational departments and students themselves are making inroads to improve nutritional alternatives on campus. Some of the nutrition that's experienced on campus has improved as a result of students making overtures to see these improvements occur. So if you're a student who is noticing a small, um, who noticing a small weight gain and have made plans to lose weight but have not been successful in the past, check out nutrition and exercise options available to you on our campus. Um, in Owen Sound, the gym is downstairs, and on the other campuses, there is gym opportunities as well. Check them out. Unhealthy eating behavior. Now, this section that we'll cover now is going to look at the unhealthy eating behavior that can make that can take many take many forms, ranging from not eating enough to eating too much, too quickly. The roots of eating disorders are complex. So let's look at some of these now. Body image, um, body image in and of itself is not treated as the disorder per se. However, many young women are, are attempting to become slimmer, while many young men are attempting to become more muscular. Part of this is based on the images that we see and what is considered to be desirable. So it becomes somewhat more of a disorder when that's our focus and not about looking inside ourselves and saying, what's important to me? How do I eat healthy and exercise healthfully? To create a lifestyle as opposed to fix an image that someone else seems to think you should be uh, striving toward? In a study, girls who watched a lot of television and expressed concerns with slimness and popularity were more dissatisfied with their bodies than girls involved in sports. So it appears it has a lot to do with what we see out there in the world being depicted about what am I supposed to look like? How am I supposed to behave like? Men and women are prone to different distortions of body images. Some of these are ones that you'd be familiar with in terms of eating disorders. Eating disorders involve serious disturbances in eating too much or too little. Individuals have greater concern for body size and body shape. Individuals with eating disorders display a broad range of symptoms that occur along a, a continuum. There are some people who are over here and some people who are in the middle and some that are over here. So the eating disorders are going to include um, anorexic, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorders. Now, who develops an eating disorder? Well, most people with eating disorder are young, usually between the ages of 14 and 25. Excuse me. They're usually white, usually female, and usually affluent backgrounds. 
Other ex often express perfectionist uh, personalities. They need to be the best or they need to be perfect, but not necessarily the best. Eating disorders are increasing among men and members of different ethnic groups. Male and female athletes are also vulnerable to eating disorders because of the pressures to maintain an ideal body weight and to achieve a weight that might enhance their performance. We're seeing this a lot in combat sports, boxing, wrestling, MMA, where the athlete may be competing in a particular weight group, perhaps a 135 or 155 pound weight category, but when they walk around and train, they're at 170 pounds. So in order to get into their weight category, they have to drop a lot of weight relatively quickly to meet the weight, um, to meet that weight at the weigh-in. And then two days later, they're in the fight and they're back up to their pre-diet weight of 170. Now that doesn't, you know, what does that do to a person's performance? Well, some find it doesn't work well at all. They're under strength and they're full of water and others, it doesn't seem to affect quite as much. We're gonna begin with the eating disorder anorexic, anorexia nervosa. And for those who suffer from this disorder, food is seen as an enemy or a threat to their sense of self-identity and autonomy. So often what um, will happen is they see themselves as fat or flabby, even when at a normal or below normal body weight. My sister had experienced this in her younger teens and early 20s. Um, she's five foot 10 normally and wakes, walks around in around the 130 to 140 pound range. She was down to 90 pounds. Now when she would look in the mirror, she'd see a fat person and of course she wasn't, but that's not what she saw. People who experience anorexia nervosa, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, their perception of themselves, their own sense of who they are, their self-identity is not what you and I see. The incidence of anorexia nervosa has increased in the, in the past three decades and mostly in developed countries, affluent countries like Canada and the United States. An estimated half a percent to 4% of young women in Canada develop anorexia. Just 2% of the population of young women in Canada. That's a very large number still. And, it is, and it's a large number in the restricting type of uh, anorexia. Individuals lose weight by avoiding any fatty foods, by dieting and fasting. They might also start exercising or smoking to control their weight. They'll eat very small amounts of food. You may not see them very frequently eating. Some people experience anorexia who eat. Sometimes they feel they should not have eaten and they'll purge. That's similar to people who experience bulimia, but not to the same rate or degree because anorexia, in anorexia, they just don't put food, much food in. In bulimia, they do. So another form, which is a little more related to men, and that's known as um, anorexia athletica or and muscle dysphoria. Anorexia athletica is not clinically defined as an eating disorder. This condition is similar to anorexia nervosa in that the individuals deal with a body image issue by overcompensating in some form of overexercising. They'll spend hours doing spin classes, weightlifting. They'll do a number of exercise in an effort to burn calories and build muscle. Their behavior gives people a sense of control and power over their bodies. People who suffer from this condition are often meticulous about their eating habits and may restrict calories as well. Some men suffer from muscle dysphoria. And this is where they engage in excessive strength tra training sessions because they have an obsessive desire to appear more muscular and lean. They may also take steroids or muscle building drugs 
and you'll find that some of the men who compete in shows to show off muscle mass are maybe someone who's experiencing muscle dysphoria at their obsessive at an excessive capacity they aim to get larger bigger leaner such that they can be you can see striations in their muscle um, mass that are existing rather than the soft muscles and rounded muscles now bulimia nervosa here are the individuals with bulimia nervosa go on repeated eating binges and rapidly consume large amounts of food but they don't stop there those with purging bulimia induce vomiting or take do um, doses of laxative to relieve guilt and control their weight now you can imagine what you can you know what this can do to one's body this eating and purging eating and purging in non Purging bulimia individuals use other means such as fasting and excessive exercises to compensate for the binges. There's an estimated between 1 and 3% of women who have developed bulimia. The average age of onset is again around the age of 18. And you might ask, why is it women seem more prone to anorexic nervosa and bulimia? In our society, there's more pressure on women to achieve a certain image. So the image and self-identity of women is more altered than men more frequently. It is noted that we, you know, we are seeing men starting to emerge with a misconception about body image more recently. Another form of eating disorder is what's called binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder is a rapid consumption of an enormously large amount of food in relation in relatively a short period of time um, and it often occurs in compulsive overeaters this isn't just i don't know you, you you're sitting at home and you eat a bag of chips and a liter of coke that's not what it is it's compulsive it's not the same as something that you and i might do on a weekend Individuals who binge eat may feel a lack of control over eating and binge at least twice a week for at least six month period. That's when it becomes clinical. So to give you an idea, you and I might binge once or twice in this, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a year or say, you know, someone in this category will binge with binge eating disorder instead more likely two to three times a week for six months. Then we've got a serious problem. Treatment includes education, learning about why do you do what you do and behavioral approaches, basically how to correct some of those things, behaviorally strategies, cognitive approaches, which would be changing the thinking and psychotherapy are also used. Now, the last form of eating disorder is what's known as extreme dieting. Extreme dieters go beyond cutting back on calories or increasing physical activity. They become preoccupied with what they eat and what they weigh. They're constantly checking their eating. They're buying only the food that's good for them for low fat intake, and they're busy, busy, busy mapping out their physical preoccupation and activities. Although their weight never falls below 85% of normal, their weight, um, what, what's 85% you know, of what's normal for the weight, weight loss is severe enough to cause uncomfortable physical consequences, and they're at an increased risk for anorexia nervosa. Dieting and exercise become ways of coping with stress in life. Many avid dieters may need counseling to correct the dangers of eating behavior and preventing further complications. It's interesting how much there is to deal with when it comes to something as simple, if you will, as eating. Compulsive overeating, people who eat compulsively,
cannot stop putting food in their mouths. They eat fast and they eat a lot. Compulsive eating is different in terms of there's a few psychological disorders that uh, involve compulsive eating. An example of one is known as Prater Willie, is an example. And this condition is one which a person constantly seeks to eat. And it doesn't have to be edible. They keep it, um, they eat and eat and eat. If it's, um, it's not what mental health professionals describe as compulsive eating, it is a food addiction that's much more likely to develop in women. It signals a potential problem with compulsive overeating and turning to food when depressed or lonely, when feeling rejected, or as a reward if food is used for a number of reasons. It can be used excessively as history of failed diets and anxiety when dieting you know, thinking about food, uh, food throughout the day, eating quickly and without pleasure, continuing to eat when you're no longer hungry, frequently talking about food or refusing to talk about food, fear of being able to stop eating once you've started can be a very difficult period. With ongoing support of, on a regular basis, Recovery from compulsive eating can be challenged, um, can be challenging because these people with this problem cannot give up entirely the substance that they abuse, and therein lies the dilemma. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. Here we go. Uh, there we go. I mean, that's that completes managing our weight. Next class, we're going to explore chapter two, and we'll go in more depth on psychosocial health. That's what that whole chapter is on. So good luck, everybody, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye now.